begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this discussion is taking place. And this may be many lands because you come from many parts of Australia. Um, I pay my respects to these owners, both past and present, and extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians with us today. Welcome Derek Scott and welcome Richard Leonard. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. But we're discussing vertical schools and the future of learning and learning space design in this really unusual year of disruption as COVID-19 has shifted us unexpectedly into virtual learning from home. Um, Derek Scott is CEO and principal of Halebury School, which is a large global school with campuses in Keysborough, Brighton, Berwick, Darwin, Beijing, but also the centre of Melbourne, and that's the one we're focusing on today. Derek was named Australia's Principal of the Year for all non-government schools, but also overall Principal of the Year in Australia by the Australian uh, Education Awards in 2019. So welcome, Derek. Thank you, Claire. Richard Leonard is an architect and director of Habel with offices in Melbourne and Sydney. Richard's an expert in educational design and he's been helping schools integrate evolving teaching and learning philosophies into creative design responses. Habel through Richard has been partnering us for over a decade on various Australian Research Council linkage projects, but also as a founding member of the Learning Environments Applied Research Network, which is our Learn Research Network at Melbourne University. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Claire. Um, if I begin with a little bit of um, background, vertical schools are a recent phenomenon in Australia, but they're much more common in Europe and Asia, and also to an extent in the United States. So St Andrew's Cathedral School has educated students in the top three levels of an eight-storey brutalist style building constructed in 1976. It's in central Sydney, but that school is, was fairly unique until recently. And now we're seeing vertical schools emerging across most of the states in Australia, most capital cities, Botanic High in Adelaide, um, Arthur Phillip in Sydney, others in Sydney, um, secondary colleges in Brisbane, Fortitude Valley, four vertical schools in Melbourne. There's been a conversion of a five-storey office building in Perth. And there's lots more on the drawing boards, on the books. And Derek, if I can begin with you, you were responsible for instigating Victoria's first self-contained vertical school for the Halebury City campus. You converted a 10-storey office building call centre into a school. And I understand that you base this decision, this, this um, journey, on 2011 census data. Is this correct? Can you tell us a little bit more about that journey, please? So, well, I love the census data. I think, um, you know, I think it's really, really interesting. And Australia is lucky to have such good data that we have. So when we looked at the, you know, obviously we saw Melbourne grow through the first um, uh, decade of this century. And I think there were something like uh, 800,000 people added to Greater Melbourne in that decade. We looked at the 2011 census data and saw there was there was a, a significant growth in uh, families with children under under five in the CBD area or in the, the the inner Melbourne area, the inner suburbs as well. But a lot of those there wasn't growth after that because a lot of them were then shifting out to find schools and things nearby. Mm -hmm. um, but it left us thinking that there was a good opportunity there for, for a vertical school model. And because of our deep engagement in Asia, I've seen many many schools in. Um, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore and, and throughout China um, that have operated well in that model. Uh, I got Bernard Salt um, and his, uh, his demographic unit who at KPMG to do some forward projections for us, which, uh, you know, showed where Melbourne was going and what the, the trends were. And from that, we developed the business model in, in, two, in 2012 and then started having a look for the right site and building. And the one we've ended up with, which, as it turns out, I think has been the perfect site in the perfect building, uh, was actually about the sixth project that we did over a, a four-year period and failed on the other five. Uh, couldn't get them over the line, either in terms of price or we were the underbidder on another building. We had a really interesting one where we were looking to build a, uh, on the top of a, a car park in Flinders Street with a big, uh, one, of, one of the biggest property developers in Australia. 
Uh, that would have been very interesting. But as it turns out, we came across this site, um, this building, and the, the, as soon as we walked into this, I knew it was the right building to, and they're on the right site to convert to a school, uh, 13,000 square meters. We knew that could be in a school for eight to 900 students, three terraces, uh, outdoor terraces, two different levels and, and the rooftop. And then the, the real feature of it was the whole front of the building overlooking Flagstaff Gardens, Melbourne's oldest park, and therefore almost a, a sort of a mini central park outlook, which was never going to be built out. And, uh, and, and that was the real feature, allowing light into the building and just beautiful outlooks, permanently green outlooks, if you like, from every uh, learning space that we have within the building. So that was a real feature for us, and that's turned out to work um, as brilliantly as I'd, I'd hoped it would. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting story. And I think being the first carries with it enormous risks. So congratulations on being, being the first. And um, Richard Habel was really the first, I think, to do the bespoke uh, vertical school in Victoria. And I'm wondering, you, you've done South Melbourne Primary School and Richmond High School, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about the design of those vertical schools. What were the opportunities and challenges that you faced? Did you find that you were taking lessons that you'd already developed within the more traditional broad campus, single double storey schools, or were you looking to Europe for lessons? It's a, it's a good question, and um, you mentioned the Cathedral School, St Andrew's Cathedral School in um, the CBD of Sydney, which is a really interesting example, because if memory serves me right, I think they started in the early 80s, so they're pretty much a you know, trailblazer in that uh, sense, and uh, I think it's about a 10-storey building. They're now in two buildings, in fact, just you know, almost contiguous to each other. But obviously a very successful example, albeit basically within a, a, a very um, sort of office building style that they've, they've had to use, office, office building style building. And I think, um, you know, that's the same with Halebury, that they've had to move into a, an office building and reconfigure that as, as best they can. I'll come back to, if I could, to a question on Derek on, on that. But... Um, stepping over to Europe, you know, certainly that's just business as usual, I guess, you know, the density of Europe really means that they've been vertical for, you know, years, if not centuries. Um, there is one project that we always reference uh, in Europe and, you know, constantly as architects, and that's the Hellerup uh, School in Copenhagen, which you and I visited, in fact, mm. a few years ago together. And, you know, that was just such a marvellous reconfiguration or reimagination of a building, not very tall, only four storeys. But, um, it, you know, there's so many lessons in that, not only from a point of view of contemporary education, but also in terms of, you know, how to do it in a, in a vertical uh, arrangement, you know, particularly in terms of, you know, how do you get an interconnection between spaces in a, a vertical stacking of buildings so that you still feel as though you're in one school. Mm. And if I can subvert the proceedings a little mm. bit, if I could mm. throw it to Derek. Um, because I'm just, I've always been wanting to ask you this question, Derek, but if you had your druthers and you had the chance to rebuild on the site in the city in Melbourne and build your dream vertical school, would it be much different? Um, it wouldn't, as it turns out, be a lot different, except for perhaps... I do love some of the, the central sort of atrium stairwells that you can have. And I've seen a lot of those in the Japanese schools, which are Japanese schools are four, generally four to five storeys. And those, those wide stairwells that can go up through there and that can be both a, a meeting place for students as well as a movement space. We did actually look at putting that into this building. Um, but given that the uh, first run through uh, the first QS we got back on that was uh, four times our budget. I had to take that out for fairly obvious reasons. But having said that, um, the, the two stairwells which we use for the movement of students, um, one we have one goes up and one comes down. And the students are expected to, it's a 10 storey building, but in most cases are expected to use the stairwells to move between the floors and they do. They've actually been really effective and, and efficient and have also reduced noise within the floors of the different buildings. So it's a very 
Uh, it's been very good for sound and teaching and learning in that way. So they're efficient for movement, but I would love a bit more flexibility around that if I was to redo the, the building. There's a lovely story about those stairwells too. I think um, the Hellerup School really started that, and that's probably a building of about 12 years old now, I think. But um, you know, they they've got that magnificent stairwell that they've taken through, which is the interconnecting device of of the whole building, and it's almost like a vertical piazza. You know, it's the meeting place of the whole school. Um, the wonderful thing, though, that Jens Guldbeck, who is the architect, and um, now sadly departed, but um, the lovely idea he had was that um, became part of the learning landscape. You know, the vertical stair was just an automatic part of the learning landscape. Um, but it was also their music room. And he said the whole idea of that was that you would, you know, you would hear this lovely music, mostly lovely from students, of course, but the lovely music would sort of permeate through the, the whole school. So you could actually get that oral connection to what's happening in other areas. And, you know, when we were there, Claire, there was uh, someone that one of the staff members was tinkling away on a, a grand piano and, mm -hmm. and you could just hear that permeating the whole school. And that's one of the things that excites me most about the mid-rise vertical schools, which is perhaps a li little more difficult once you get to the 10th storeys of, of Halebury or, or the taller um, Arthur Phillip High School in Sydney, is the way that central atrium, with what we've got to call the heller up stairs, those broad, wonderful stairs that you can sit on and have a lecture on, how they've become the heart of these, um, these vertical vertical schools. You mentioned budgets, um, Richard, and I just wanted to touch on that. Um, I understand these vertical schools, they are more expensive to build than the low-rise schools, but in terms of value for money, that all worked out quite well for Halebury, I understand, Derek. Yeah, the total project, so we paid 52 uh, 0.5 million for the uh, for the building and uh, the, the, the fit out was just around 25 so it was for a school of 800 and it really it could accommodate 900 um, or you know 950 but we've, we've sort of capped it at 800 to give us some more flexible spaces uh, it was in the just under 80 million so that was a, a pretty good total cost for for what we're doing yeah yeah um, Richard you don't want to comment at all on the budget on vertical schools versus traditional schools like obviously there are so the pressures of building in in a, in a in a suburbs means that there's just not the land available is there to do to go down other pathways no and i think it, look it's a really good question claire in the sense that there's some there's some pros and cons i mean you you win some on, in in terms of you're actually building almost invariably on a very small lot of land so you know in terms of building or, or you know developing ovals and maintaining those sorts of things you don't have that um, but on the other hand there are obviously um, uh, some additional costs that you need to consider in terms of the verticality extra things such as extra circulation space lifts um, you're getting into more sophisticated uh, construction systems and building maintenance systems. You may have, you know, for instance, um, um, sprinklers and, and, you know, such devices that you don't need on other buildings. Mm. Mm. Um, to everybody that's um, listening, if a question arises as you're listening, please feel free to submit it through the Q&A. We'll keep um, talking with Richard and Derek, but I hope we'll get to some of your questions later on. And um, in Victoria, students have recently returned to schools after many weeks of um, virtual learning. Derek, how are those teachers and students going coming back to the school? Well, uh, they're, look, they're all very excited to be back. Um, and all, although having said that, I think, you know, we've, we've all learned new ways to work. And, and because we, we were well ahead with technology and, and, and delivered a full virtual classroom program, so we had a really uninterrupted process right for our preps through to year 12s in terms of their academic progress. In fact, our testing shows that um, they are going as well, if not better, than, than they would have been in the, um, in the normal classroom environment. But nonetheless, it's that social interaction, obviously, that people have missed a lot. We still don't have uh, two of our year levels, our year eights and nines back. They'll be back on Monday. Uh, and they've had a pretty tough time with pretty six months off school. And so they'll be very excited to be back and, and seeing their friends. Are there, are there particular issues for you in a vertical school? Like we're sort of understanding going back to high rise city office mm. buildings. There are issues around public transport, around use of lifts, stairs, 
um, playing indoors? Has that been a problem for you that you're not experiencing in your suburban campuses? It's a, it's a good question. In terms of the actual process of students coming into the building, we've got our best health processes in place because they all come through, you know, as you would an office building, the central space and everyone's temperature tested and can be checked and make sure they've got their mask on everything as they, they come in and through there. So it's probably the, the, the safest in terms of health and health and safety uh, around that. Um, I was did some uh, asking around about different campus heads this morning and the, the city campus head said their students are coming back in really good health and fitness. Um, which is interesting because a lot of them do live in, in small spaces in the city or in uh, houses nearby. Um, and I think they, they've already got a process of sort of looking after their health and fitness in that environment, which um, has uh, continued pretty well. So no particular uh, problems there. Um, and in fact, one of our outer suburban campuses said the children perhaps were, were coming back less fit than they had been or maybe less used to... Um, missing community sport and other sporting activities and, and didn't quite have the processes maybe to keep their health and fitness up in the same way. So it's been interesting to observe our different sites and the impact on people. Interesting. We've actually had a, an audience question which relates to budget. So if you don't mind, I might ask that question now. And Derek, it's probably something that you have a good sense of, which is to do with operational costs. Are they much higher than our standard schools? Are you finding a big difference there? Well, uh, they're actually, Melbourne schools, of course, everyone loves to have their, their, you know, five to 20 acres around their school. Our city school has the most beautiful outlook over a park that's fully maintained by Melbourne City Council. So uh, we save an awful lot on some of those <laughs> operational costs. Uh, it's, it's our most effective in terms of operational or, our, you know, most efficient in terms of operational costs, which is uh, highest in terms of build costs and, and land cost, obviously, but, but very efficient to run. Um, Richard, that's not something that you want to comment on or is? I knew that um, I think that's an interesting comment from Derek in, in terms of the running costs. And, mm -hmm. you know, I suppose that goes to also the point about it's a different type of building. You know, you are forced into a higher grade of building. And in that sense, I suspect that we're, we're looking at um, a much more efficient lifestyle uh, sort of life, life cycle cost. You know, and in terms of um, investing bigger money at the front end and building a structure which, you know, all, all city buildings are basically built for a, you know, 50, 100 year scenario um, compared to what we might be doing with uh, simpler single storey or double storey buildings in the burbs. Yeah. And, and just to, on that, within the build costs, you know, as I said, we, the, the first run of the budget was four times what I had to spend on it. So you start to look at both the design, but then what, what can we recycle and save? So it was a 30 year old building, but basically we changed almost none of the floor tiles or the ceiling tiles. We put a few different colors and things through there, but you know, saved millions of dollars in by not doing that across 10 floors. And I haven't had anyone come to me and say, well, you know, I'm not sending my kid there because that ceiling tile is a little bit, a little bit off color. Um, so it is really interesting where you can actually save the money and then spend it on the teaching and learning if you can find the right building to, to refit. Yeah. I've got a question for both of you, but I want to begin with you, um, Richard. So, you know, during this time of COVID-19, we have, it's been disruptive. We're working in very different ways, but also perhaps opens new opportunities, which I'm, wondering whether this is going to have impacts in your mind about how we design schools or do you think that once everybody's back at school and COVID's a thing of the past we'll just revert back to where we were pre-2020? I sincerely hope it's not the latter Claire and um, you know that I, I suppose one of the the lessons of human nature is we do forget the, the lessons of the past very quickly. You know what surprises me is how quickly um, we collectively have been able to to change the way we do things and you know that's been by necessity obviously and and just on that there's a little article that was in the age a few weeks ago and um they were making the, the point about how the teaching profession was coping and uh, this was Mark McKelson from The Age, but he said, few professions have changed as much and as frequently as that of a teacher in 2020. We pivoted to home learning, went back to school, then full circle again. And I think, you know, that's, it was a great comment because I think the whole teaching profession had to basically, you know, change overnight and they did and they were successful. 
And um, my uh, daughter is in year 12 and she attends the, the school just across the road from uh, Derrick School in, in Brighton. And, um, you know, one thing that I think is never going to go back that, that was one of the lessons out of COVID was we had parent-teacher night online. And I was asking the teachers, you know, everyone that we were coming to, how do you like it? How do you coping? And they were saying, oh, we're never going to, you know, do the face-to-face -face with parent-teacher nights again. We don't need to. And that was a really good uh, sort of practical lesson. I think the other thing to say that um, Professor Stephen Heppel in the UK made a really good point to say the genie is out of the bottle. You know, the COVID has been a trigger point for uh, changing in practices, you know, in, in, particularly in terms of digital um, methodologies. And I think he's right. You know, the genie is, going, is out of the bottle and there's no going back, that we're going to see much more sort of blended learning opportunities continuing. Um, we're seeing that with a lot of schools that we're dealing with. They're talking about the need to have uh, spaces for staff, for instance, to develop um, online learning scenarios because they're saying we're still doing the face-to-face -face stuff. We'll always do that, and that's still the most important. But we're going to be doing elements of it online. So we need the, you know, the structures, not only the digital structures, but the physical structures also to deliver that. So I think that's one of the really key mm. things. Um, Derek, is the genie out of the bottle or or do you think that the system will revert? Uh, the genie is out of the bottle and there'll be significant parts of the system that will revert. Um, I'm seeing a lot of schools that have got plenty of capacity to change and evolve quickly, but that are looking like they're a bit comfortable to go back to what they did before. And of course the system, that is our education system, uh, that's delivered, you know, by the government, by the state, is going to take longer to drag along that journey because there's always a lot more um, organisation to bring that through. So, but I am hugely excited about about the future of education. And so we are we are a multi-campus school. So we we're already delivering uh, classes across via technology across multiple sites. That will grow exponentially now, and I expect that every one of our students going through um, from year ten to twelve will have. Uh, at least 20% of their time um, using Zoom and, and classes that are that are multi uh, that involve students from multiple campuses. And you, you only, we know that's where the workforce is. So why wouldn't we be saying this is what we need to be working through at school to have you ready for university and the workforce afterwards as well? I'll be. Uh, I'll get. We're we're working flat out on the the. Uh, delivery of a full virtual school within the next 12 months that we're well underway with planning and developing that will not just be based around Melbourne or Australia, but that it will have the potential globally to bring um, people into it. And, and with that, we're working on a big set of programs around micro-credentialing and elective choices for students that can be delivered anywhere, anytime, and open up. So if you think of a student coming through middle school now and what they might have as a choice at year seven, eight or nine, they might have two or three elective choices or you know, maybe a few more um, in each semester to go through. But if you put this into the virtual space and you micro-credential it and you have that authentic authenticated, there's no reason you can't have 150 choices for students um, as they come through the school. And you might have some of those students in a collaborative space. You might have 20 students there still with, with a teacher looking with them, but they might be doing 10 different tasks in collaboration with students around the world in other spaces. So these are the things that we already had in planning, mm -hmm. um, but that we're pushing very hard with to have, have uh, ready to go as quickly as possible. And I, I think it then opens up a whole range of things for, for great mm -hmm. teachers as well. And many of our teachers have found they, they love working in the virtual space and they, they might miss the students, but they love working in that space as well. And so I think, choices for teachers, for students. It's going to be about choice because just one more point on that, our students, um, many of them have discovered, you know, they, they like being more in control of their own learning in their own spaces as well. So, uh, you know, how and that will flow into the architecture. What sort of spaces do we want at school to actually encourage students to be at school, to share and to build the social relationships that we want when we actually know that a much more significant percentage of their academic progress can be done in the virtual space. It's got huge implications for, for space also. And it's been fascinating for me to, um, 
uh, work with educators who previously previously said you can do some things in a virtual environment, but you can't do what I teach. And then suddenly, within a week, they are teaching mm. virtually and understanding there are some benefits, but it also makes us much more aware of the benefits of face to face, you know, appropriate learning. I'm going to get to the the thing that worries people most about vertical schools, fatter, sicker, sadder. So my urban planning colleague at Griffith University, Dr. Tony Matthews, he doesn't particularly like this phrase. It was introduced by Brendan Gleeson. But he does worry that these contemporary urban environments are really impacting children's health and well-being. Mm. So children in apartments, they might not have access to a backyard, but at least in the past at school, they had others they could run around and playgrounds. So Derek, you represented both Australia and New Zealand at underage cricket, I hear. Are your Halebury students missing out on the city campus by not having access to the facilities that you had as a child? They, they don't have those same opportunities mm. that you had. Yeah, it's a really good question. So on the, on the site itself, we've got um, the two, two terraces for students to uh, go outside and a rooftop terrace, which is more of a passive space. Because the project's been so successful, we, we have... We there's a there's Melbourne's oldest church just across the road. We've leased a 99 year lease on a on a thousand square meter site there, which is now an outdoor um, you know basketball sort of ball space for students to use. So that's a very urban uh, outdoor space, which I really you know sort of semi New York sort of space, which is great fun. Uh, and we've got a um, a 1,000 square meter indoor space which doesn't have a high ceiling but has a running track and has other facilities. So there's a lot there, and the park across the road as well, where uh, our students have the choice because uh, it is supervised across there. Our students have the choice that each day to say whether they're going to stay in the building for their lunch or go across the park as well. Um, I think our, our parents who come into this community are really aware of the issues that you raise from their own living in fairly dense environments in, in, in a Melbourne. Um, and therefore, and, and most of you know, our parents are healthy and fit themselves and, and that flows through to their children. So from our point of view, we haven't seen any evidence that the students are um, less fit or disadvantaged. Um, and then what we do, they also, students from year seven up also participate in our sports programs uh, and compulsory Saturday sport using our other facilities uh, that we, where we've got the space. But what's interesting about this, and this is another thing that's changing, is um, we still do all the traditional sports that, that schools, um, you know, in Melbourne who have compulsory sport have done. But our most popular sports are really the lifestyle sports that we offer. So our fastest growing sport now is rock climbing. Oh. Um, and the students love it. It's now an Olympic sport and it's about also about teamwork. You've got to look after each other. And, and uh, you know, across our junior and middle school, I think we've got well over 200 students now who do rock climbing as one of their, one of their sports during the season. And then that flows into your lifestyle sports, which obviously can be other, you know, aerobics, fitness and health and other things. And that, I think that's fantastic because those sort of sports are not necessarily, a lot of students don't go on with team sports when they, they, they leave school, but you can build these in, in a way that, um, you know, really hopefully become a part of their healthy lifestyle into the future as well. Mm. Derek, you mentioned the um, parent community, but there's also a broader neighbourhood that these schools are located in. And I think the schools play an important role. And Richard, each Saturday, I most Saturdays, I walk past your school in Richmond and the playgrounds are open, there are kids in there playing basketball or skateboarding or, or hanging out. And I think that the schools do play an important role in connecting to communities, offering facilities. I think the ground floor of Richmond has drama facilities, music, arts that the community use, but also Richmond's right next to community facilities such as the pool, the netball courts, uh, there's an oval right there. So the kids have you know, there's this, there's this really interesting morphing between the community and the school, and it's a win-win. Is this something that's unique, do you think, to the vertical schools or, you know, exaggerated in the vertical schools, or is it something that's now happening in every school that gets built around Australia? I think it's certainly been triggered to some extent by the need to reimagine what schools are in a in a vertical environment, and particularly in the, you know, any of the inner urban environments are invariably pretty dense, and um, you know, uh, are probably um, really challenging 
our basic mental models of what a standard school is. You know, primary school, you get three and a half you know, uh, hectares in the suburbs. If it's a secondary school, you get seven or eight. You know, we're, we're starting to build on spaces that are down to, um, you know, half a hectare. And, and that really means you need to use the provisions of the community uh, and vice versa. The community can start to use the provisions of the school. And I was, I was really pleased to hear, you know, Derek talk about what's happening at, um, at the uh, King Street School in, uh, in their city campus. And just thinking, well, you can, you can walk four blocks down the road from there and you're in one of Australia's really specialist buildings with rock climbing. A school couldn't, you know, a normal school in the Burps couldn't compete against that. So, you know, to me, I think um, one of the great lessons that came out of our uh, early design work with uh, South Melbourne and Richmond to, to some extent also, was when we were having the community seminars and, you know, getting the, the community inputs and these were prospective parents, etc. And it was a really bold decision from the department to build these schools in, in <clears throat> um, communities that were in South Melbourne's case just emerging in Richmond's case was a rebuild of a school that had been closed about 20 years ago but one of the the fundamental questions that was asked was what are the provisions of a school that the school can provide that the community can't and vice versa what can the community provide um, for the school that the school can't provide, i.e. the oval or what have you. So, for instance, with South Melbourne, um, they can go about uh, 500 metres away to the, the Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre. And, you know, there you've got your, one of Melbourne's premier um, Olympic uh, uh, swimming pools. Um, and there's lots of other facilities in, in the area. But also, I think, you know, just to, to finally make the point about that interconnection with the community, um, in both cases, I think the wonderful thing is they're becoming a genuine, authentic community hub. You know, it's schools as community hub. And in the case of South Melbourne, of course, it was, it was built without fences, we are, you know, very purposefully to engage with their community and to some extent with Richmond too. So it was very much part of their thinking and mm -hmm. saying we're state system schools, we belong to the community and, you know, we've got to relate to each of those specific communities. So we've talked about community connections. Let's move inside and talk about the learning spaces themselves. And we've got an interesting question um, about vertical schools and whether there's a certain appropriateness to age groups. You know, are they better for younger, middle or older students? Now, Derek, your school is for all age students. Richard, you've done a primary and a high school. So it will be, I think, you're well placed to answer this question yeah. Is there a certain age for which you would not recommend a vertical school? No, uh, I think that that's the really interesting thing around having the, the ELC, so the three-year-old through to year 12 is all on the, the same space. And what we did with that was essentially um, there's, there's big floor plates on the bottom. The first two levels are 2,000 square metres and then up from that it's 1,000 square metres and that's where your terraces start. On those levels, we put lots of big rooms for drama and music and, and where gatherings of people. And then from the uh, third level up is where you start the teaching spaces. And we start those with, with ELC and junior school and then move up the higher you go up the school through the senior school. Um, there's different designs that you do for those floors um, uh, that, that have been particularly effective. And by the time you're getting up to our ninth and 10th floor, you're getting students who are you know, one or two years away from heading off and most of our students will go into university or further study. So that's what we're trying to replicate in that space, those sort of um, post-school study spaces and workspaces that they will come through. Whereas uh, our spaces in the junior school are um, really designed around our approach to teaching and learning. Uh, and that is we follow an I do, we do, you do approach in our junior school, which means the teacher works with the student on a task first, the I do, then it's the, the you do, the student does it, uh, works through the issue themselves or the task that they're doing. And then the we do is the collaborative part where the students come together and all work together on it. So you have, you need those three sets of spaces, which are the teacher in front of the class in a fairly traditional way, uh, then the you do where the student needs to be able to work quietly for themselves. And then the we do, which is the collaborative space where they're all working together. And so 
Um, we've managed those spaces, I think, pretty well. Um, a key for us in the vertical school was getting the sound right so that um, students yeah, every uh, could move in and out of those spaces and not be disruptive and have the, both the traditional and the collaborative. So, you know, when we did the fit out, we put made sure that there was extra money in making sure that anything we put up in terms of a glass or walls went all the way, not just to the ceiling tiles, but to the ceilings. And, and that's been that's really worked well. And that that's really you know, one piece of advice uh, that I would have to anyone designing or developing that, because if the sound isn't right, uh, I think it, it, it creates a whole range of issues for, for learning. Derek, you use a lot of glass in your schools, so they do um, help with acoustics, but they allow visual um, access. So as you walk through your schools, you can see learning happening. That's something I think that visibility of learning happening is something that's really apparent in the vertical schools. And it's quite different, isn't it, to the, the high schools that are lower scale where you'll have the STEM building that might be separate to the arts building mm. that might be separate to the, um, to the, to the gym. Um, we, we have had a question about one of the surprise issues coming back to schools is the sensory overload of having so many people around after being in isolation. And it impacts both staff and students. And the question is, is that a factor in vertical schools? You know, it's, it's exacerbated in vertical schools rather than traditional schools. Mm -hmm. Derek? Uh, I don't think so. And I, and I say that because I'm standing at our Keysborough campus and we've actually kept our campuses separate. So at the moment, because we're not having staff moving between campuses or students, but so I, my, the, our campus leaders there haven't said that it's been a particular issue above and beyond. Uh, I, th I think it's a valid thing to say. It is a different experience for people coming back into a large group after, you know, six months of, of not being a part of that. But I don't think it's, it's exacerbated by the city environment. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think that um, probably what it does do, though, Claire, is it just reinforces um, one of the most overlooked things about schools themselves. And Derek touched on this. You know, it's the social aspect of education that is really important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kids like getting together fundamentally. You know, we're a, we're a, a herd mentality, basically, as, as humans. And I think, you know, that's one of the really interesting lessons that I think has come out of COVID and the whole experience. And kids, you know, we've seen it on the news. Kids are saying, oh, I never thought I'd say this, but I missed school. Yeah. You know, they'd love to come back. And I know, you know, just again, using my daughter as an example, in year 12, um, she loved the COVID experience because she, she said, I can do um, my work at school online and in bed. She didn't even have to get out of bed, you know, but she she really missed that campus experience. And I think that's, um, you know, that's a bit of a cheeky story in a way, but there's a really important part of this that I think, you know, we do have to rethink the model of schools in terms of that social aspect. And again, I'm, I'm really interested in, interested in what Derek was talking about with that full virtual school. And you're looking at, um, obviously, as you said, that, that range of choices. But I'm intrigued to, to think through that social experience and how you can actually still deliver that to, in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Julia Ratkin, who we you know, is a great educationist and we work with quite a lot. She has a great term for it. She said, well, you just can't beat the 3D learning, you know, that interface between student and staff and the nuances and the, you know, the frown on their face when they're trying to struggle with a, an issue. You just can't beat that 3D element of, of learning. How do you think we get the balance or what can you offer in the full virtual school to at least um, try to address some of those issues? Yeah, it's a really good question. And we, so we've got a, I've got a, a four month plan now working through uh, vision strategy and business plan for this while at the same time as we do that, we'll be launching a whole series of education products for the summer break around skills and development for people who might have missed out. Um, and uh, that's a key question for us. And again, I think it'll come down to choice and flexibility and where people are. In Australia, we've got a pretty solid, um, you know, government system of education. We, we, we may have slipped over the last 20 years from, you know, fifth or sixth in the OECD to 15th to 20th, but it's still a largely a good system and serves people well. That's not necessarily the case in 
in uh, a lot of other countries. Um, and so it'll be about people making a choice, won't it, around whether uh, they think on the academic side they can get a better virtual, better program through the virtual school. We think that of our students here this year, around 10% of them actually did better academically online. So even for some of some students like that, it might be a component of, of, of a hybrid model where there are still some components where they might come to a site for school and others that they do at home. And then there might be the notion around that of studio schools as well. So if you have 100 students in a city who are in your virtual school, um, they may be able to come in one day a week in you know, groups of 20 to get a social element that goes with that. So these are all these different models. I'm not, I don't think it has to be one model. And then of course, you know, in Australia, we've got an awful uh, challenge with bringing remote communities and bringing um, students up to speed with that. And we think particularly with the success that we've had with our teaching pedagogy, I do, we do, you do, the fact that we already work with 100 schools around Australia on that, on delivering it in their schools and supporting them in that, we think there's a really interesting equity issue there. If we can deliver with great teachers that to students also who might be in remote communities and to train, to support and train some of those teachers in remote communities as well, there's a, there's a broader issue of how we might be able to contribute to to standards overall for some disadvantaged communities. Richard, I um, also agreed with Julie where I just valued the face-to-face -face so much in my education that I flipped the classroom and delivered online what I would otherwise have done in a lecture format in order to increase face-to-face. And so I went kicking and screaming to a fully online subject. You know, I just didn't want to do it. And it, it was really interesting. It opened my eyes eyes to new kinds of learning communities that are virtual where you actually are doing different kinds of things. So I, I like this rich environment that Derek's describing where you get the best of um, both worlds. But it is, it's, it's taken longer than we thought to emerge. And I think COVID maybe is the, you know, the disruption that will shift things dramatically and also having early adopters like um, Halebury perhaps. There's been a, a, an interesting um, question, um, and and I don't I'm not aware of an answer, but I'll, I'm interested to know whether either of you um, are aware of this. Has there been any research analysis on the mental health impacts on children who attend vertical schools compared with traditional school sites? Perhaps, Derek, it's something that you could at least anecdotally talk about. Hmm, um, good question. Well, look, we track all of our data of uh, students across all of our campuses, uh, attendance with our psychologists and with support and those who might need extra help. We also track our um, employee program as well and who accesses that across campuses. And the um, so it's a very small sample. It's, it's our four campuses in Melbourne, but there's, there's our mental health of students at City, of both uh, students and and staff is, is the equivalent of across the other three sites that we run in Melbourne as well. So on a very small sample, um, we're very happy with the way that that's tracking. Yeah, it's, it's always very difficult, isn't it, to think about cause and effect. And maybe there are some correlations between the two, but the questions are so much bigger, aren't they? There's the big lifestyle questions. But Richard, I think it's a really good time I perhaps to ask. Sorry, can I add to that one thing? There's one interesting thing around that. Um, which, which came out of our, our China campus, uh, which is a boarding school, and it's just out of Beijing. So it's, it, it is a, a semi-rural area on the border of Beijing and Tianjin. One of the things that's, and it's got fabulous facilities for sport and physical activity and other things, that all of the students coming there come from high-density environments, apartment living. And what struck us when we, uh, when we were started to deliver sports programs there was that these students, many of them had very good skills at, for, let's use basketball as an example, of shooting a basket, for example, basketball, for example. But when you put them on a court with a team, they had no idea what to do because they'd never actually done any collaborative team activity in that way. So that was really interesting for us to think in China about the way we'd restructure the program um, in some ways, less on skill development on more and, and more on team development and work that, that because, of course, they were all ten, uh, nearly all coming from single child families as well. So I, I just thought that was an interesting example mm -hmm. in a different um, really interesting. 
Mm. And, and if I can sort of continue on with this question, Richard, of health and well-being, it's something dear to my heart. I think the built environment plays a really significant role in our health and well-being. And to the extent that we've we've been instigating a um, graduate cert that will be launched in 2021 around this particular topic. But can you take us through some of the ways that the built environment vertical schools can support the health and well-being of students, whether it's through designing communities or biophilic design. Yeah, <clears throat> I think you've, you've touched on something really interesting here, Claire, and I was just going to make a comment on that question because, you know, it was a fascinating question about mental health. And I was, I was thinking, what is behind that question that someone thinks that a vertical school impacts a student so differently in terms of mental health. You know, this, and I'm not being critical, but it's, you know, it's perhaps a very different mental mo model we have of what school is and green spaces and views, et cetera. But, you know, vertical schools can be just as stimulating, if not more stimulating. And the fact that they, um, as Derek alluded, you know, that the, the students generally come from the city and they go to the city school, it's what they're comfortable with. And, you know, we're city livers. So, um, you know, the, the, using the collateral of the city can be way more exciting than, than, than being in the suburbs, you know, going to the galleries, going to the, you know, the, 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 the Melbourne Olympic pool, going rock climbing, you know, these things are right on your doorstep. And I think that we can forget about that. So, you know, I'd always sort of put the other side to the coin is that it could be seen in that way. But I think coming back to your question, yeah. it's another trigger of COVID. I think it really has forced... Um, very seriously a rethinking of uh, per, trying to provide, if you like, those biophilic provisions of a school in a vertical circumstance. That is, we're just not putting you in, in stacked bo boxes and, and making it as efficient as possible. We've got to be thinking of, of the mental well-being and, um, uh, you know, the, the ability and the need that humans have to see green space, to get fresh air. And I was um, just reflecting that one of, again, one of the great lessons of COVID is a lesson that we probably learnt at the beginning of the century when we had the TB pandemic, um, uh, you know, sweeping through the world. And at that stage, a movement in um, open air schools started originally in Germany, in, in Berlin, uh, but quickly moved across the world. In fact, in Australia, New Zealand, and New Zealand still has some of their open air schools still exist existing. I mean, they, you know, it fooled me for a while. I thought, what the hell is, you know, it's too cold in New Zealand. Mm. But actually, there, was, there, there were simply schools that could be opened up and were prioritising um, fresh air, ventilation, connection with the environment as part of the, um, the well-being of the student. And, you know, in a sense, we've probably lost that. And I think that's, you know, again, COVID has forced a rethinking of that, that they're important things that not only do we have to have um, a consideration to so social distancing, but the fundamentals of fresh air, light, um, views, um, feeling um, good within your space are fundamental to a student learning. So I think, yeah, the biophilic approach is, is the best capture of that. So um, bio, biophilia is um, developing systems that are connected to, to nature. And Derek, you've mentioned a couple of times the importance, and I can see the view out through your window where you are, that, that importance of being able to be feel connected to, to nature. I've, I've got a question on operational issues in vertical schools around scheduling spaces and um, whether there are ways of managing those. Perhaps it's a question for you, Derek. Are there any limitations with vertical schools to managing um, changing demand pressures in terms of student numbers? And maybe that's coming towards this idea that one level would be for one year level. You know? mm -hmm. Perhaps I'm not. I'm second guessing what the question's about, but it's to do with those operational issues. Are well, yeah, I think that's a good question, and thank you for explaining biophilic. You're a good teacher, Claire, because I was going to have to look that up afterwards. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but uh, yeah, look, operationally, I, city uh, vertical schools, I think, are fabulous in the sense that they are much easy, easier, for example, to keep open as we do from 7:30 in the morning till 6:30 at night. So, you know, our long daycare runs through that time, but it's available for students of any age to come in. And, and, and what we find in the city, 
campus uh, is that the students stay there for, for long hours after school doing their work together and collaboratively. Schools tend to be very underutilized in terms of you know, their actual capacity of using um, uh, facilities, particularly the, the built um, the classrooms and other things. Whereas uh, we think there's, we haven't used all of the potential of that yet, but we think we've got greater potential when we look at virtual school environments and other things to run different hours for students to run um, over extended hours. So for example, we have our Darwin campus and Darwin uh, you know, shifts between, uh, is what, an hour and a half behind at the moment. So we may run uh, classes you know, after hours at our city campus that can be tied in with Darwin as well. And you might have a teacher from Melbourne who's working and teaching on both or from the other way. So mm -hmm. I just think there's more opportunity and one of the interesting things when we started the school was uh, for Melbourne parents, they were all worried about safety as well. It was kind of the number one issue that kept, or maybe the number two after how are we going to fitness and health. But um, it's the, you know, our other campuses are on between, you know, there's uh, that seven acres of Brighton out to 80 acres of Berwick. It's really hard to keep them as secure as you would like around all the perimeters and borders. The city campus is really straightforward in terms of safety and therefore you feel much better having it open for longer hours and knowing that it's safe as well with, with mm. students of different ages in there. Mm. Claire, if I could just uh, add a comment to that, because again, I think that's an, another really good example of, of how we, we need to think or rethink uh, the model of school. And as, as Derek was alluding to there, you just have to sort of reset the, um, you know, the daily uh, 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 timetable to a certain extent to accommodate the particular needs of a vertical school. And in South Melbourne, there was there was one really good example where um, at the moment, the, the young kids, the, the very small kids, uh, happen to be right up the top of the building. They don't necessarily have to be. They can be anywhere. But the school is currently running with the youngies at the, at the very top. So that's level five. And <clears throat> they've timed it. But to get the, the, the little tykes down from level five down to the ground floor, so they go to the little play area outside, takes 12 and a half minutes. Because the, the little kids, of course, you know, the brain function at the moment is only allowing you to do one step at a time, one step, and then one step, and then one step. So it takes 12 and a half minutes. And we haven't got enough lifts, can't afford enough lifts to, to take them all down in, in a lift anyway. So that has the impact for, from their point of view to say, okay, it takes 12 and a half minutes to get downstairs. It's going to take probably 15 minutes to get them back upstairs. So even if you just have to run them down to, to the play area, you have to figure that into your daily timetable and just allow for that. Mind you, you could you could also argue really good exercise to get from A to B and B to A. Mm -hmm. Timetables, such an interesting part of an education. System. I reckon every school needs to investigate their timetable. Every university. Can we talk about viral learning, virtual learning, and shifting towards the future school? Because this year has been really confronting for us, and you know, in, in more ways than just online learning, our reliance on the internet for news, communications, meetings, socialising, it's never been greater. And I think we're seeing threats to democracy through viral fake news and misinformation. Q&A on Monday night and the recent documentary, The Social Dilemma, highlighted how we become reinforced in our own biases, our own little worlds through social media. And so there are these concurrent issues for student and maybe teacher um, mental health and well-being. And Derek, I, I wanted to ask you about how your students and staff are dealing with these challenges. Are we, should we be optimistic or should we be very concerned as a community in this sort of changing viral world that we live in? That's, that's a... I'll be a fascinating question and a big challenge, obviously. And I think, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, the optimism at the start of the internet and how it would open up a whole set of new ideas for people and uh, and be able to explore. And, and the reality is it's probably narrowed people's exposure to ideas because, as you say, you just seek your own confirmation bias and there's plenty of avenues for that. So I think uh, media literacy in schools is one of the most important things we have to deliver on and whether that's through an English program or separate from that um, is a part of it. And, um, and that is building into our programs, particularly through our middle school students as they start to be exposed to that more, the whole deeper analytical thinking that comes around that. And so that's a huge focus for us across all of our subjects 
and and you know you can you obviously you're doing a lot of analysis in English and in science, but I think we've got to be very explicit about what media literacy actually means as well. And I uh, I see a really interesting opportunity for us with that in the virtual space as well. So you know we might make a compulsory unit for all of our students, for example, in year eight to compete or to complete might be a virtual media literacy course. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be taught in the classroom. It can be taught in in the media that they are actually engaging with. And uh, so we're working on that one, and, you know, and, and that might go alongside another, we've already got a compulsory course for our year eights, which is a, a startup course that everyone does for a semester around the whole notion of the way so many of our young people need to think now in terms of, you know, developing their own projects and collaboration and working on things and trialing and pitching them and all of that. So I think th these, again, are some really interesting opportunities. So I'm optimistic about it, but I don't, underestimate the extraordinary uh, challenges of it in terms of, you know, building that capacity within young people over the next uh, next generation. Thank you for, for such a, a sort of comprehensive and perhaps optimistic um, answer. We're reaching the end of our hour and um, there has been a, a question. It's a question for you, Derek, but I'm actually going to push it to Richard in the first place, because this has been a conversation we've been having for a very long time with each other. And it's this issue about the classroom, is the classroom dead versus open plan? And I think for many people, there's a dichotomy, you know, it's one or the other. Whereas you, Richard, and many of us who've been working this area are understanding much more about nuanced spaces, purposeful spaces, um, spaces for a whole range of social learning experience. So the, the question, which is for Derek, but I'm asking you first, Richard, is can you discuss your learning spaces in terms of openness? Because there's been feedback from some educators that the open plan environments being rolled out lately is often challenging for some educators in the sense of classroom boundaries. Is there a sweet spot between open plan team teaching and individual classrooms from the more traditional teaching model? So Richard, this is what you work, this is your bread and butter. This is what you excel at, working with learning communities to really think through what spaces would work for their learning conversations. And look, I think we could have a very vibrant debate for the next three hours, Claire, just on this issue. And um, I know, you know, no school is the same. Every Everyone is approaching it with their, their own um, nuance with this, but we're, we're certainly not, and I'm personally, and I know you aren't in favour of open uh, spaces from the point of view of, you know, they just don't work. But, you know, one of the things that I think has been again, one of the great triggers of COVID has been to think in terms of what Derek was talking about, how we switch our thinking and approaches to dealing with the complex, wicked challenges that we have. And to me, this coming back to the classroom, that is one of the biggest triggers that we can have to rethink the spaces that we need to support education is, i.e., what are you doing to, to deal with these complex, wicked challenges? And they're not just, as we know, that the straight disciplinary spaces. It's all about dealing with things in a, in a complex world that is interdis interdisciplinary and collaborative and um, very much, you know, e exploring the issues. So, the classroom, to me, in, in, in summary, is always going to be there. It's still, you know, the industrial era, perfect piece of design for that one-to-many um, uh, session, you know, the didactic teaching and learning. Can't beat it, but it has to be supported with a whole lot of other potential uh, activities and functionalities and spaces that are going to deal with this world that we live in. And um, Derek, I'm going to ask you that you're the one that we're meant to, was meant to be asked that question, but I'm going to expand it a little bit um, because um, I'm not as convinced as you, Richard, that the classroom is the best format. I, I think that it um, entrenches us a little bit too much to thinking about a class size and a room. So we can have that discussion a wee bit more, but I want to ask you the question about openness, but I also want to ask about furniture and desks because my three kids, when they were growing up, they had desks in each of their rooms. Did they ever use the desks? They would be down in the kitchen working at the table with me. They'd be on their bed. 
they wouldn't be using their desk too much. So I just want to also challenge the classroom full of desks. Is that the right learning environment for our kids? Well, you know, I look around my office here and I've got four different levels. I've got some chairs over there. I can sit and have a meeting with a couple of other people. I've got a, a bit of a boardroom table where I might meet with 10. I've got a higher table just behind me here where I might meet with four. That's I've got this classroom, isn't it? standing out here. There's no reason our classroom shouldn't look like that as well. Different layers, different levels, different opportunities to bring students together. The one thing, I because I, I do think the classroom space will stay, but everything we've done around it, and, and you know, we've got seven campuses, but I've never had the chance to build one from scratch. So everything I've been doing has been retrofitting what was there before. And by and large, that's meant knocking out walls and putting glass in. And then outside of that glass, having collaborative spaces for four, six, eight people so that Every space where you're teaching, you can look in and you can look out and you've still got uh, sound and things that work well. And that's flowing well into our next phase, which is at the moment, we're in the process of tri trialing, five, well, not trialing, but using five different models of teaching from face-to-face -face teaching through to the virtual online with a Zoom classroom where you might have, you know, uh, six or seven students on each campus through to swivels where you might have uh, 16 students in your class, but three who are somewhere else interstate or overseas and I can't remember what the fifth one is now but there's five different models of teaching that we're working with at the moment and they're all working within the, the spaces that we've had um, and the other point I'd say on that and this is for uh, peer observation and collaboration and improvement we've always built a very strong open classroom environment partly because of that glass I'm really excited about where that takes teaching in the future because we can now there's no reason why I can't have someone observing my class in Melbourne from who's a master teacher in Darwin and saying well and and this is not about line management this is just about me saying oh have a look at this class and give me some feedback you can be doing that from anywhere to anyone now and that's hugely exciting if you've got the culture around continuous sort of improvement um, within the teams of teachers that you have. Derek and Richard I wish we could keep talking we haven't spoken about team teaching yet we haven't spoken about how the building might be used by the community after hours there's lots more to talk about but it's been a great conversation i've really appreciated the questions that have come in thank you to simon elschlepp for um, converting the questions into summary questions for me and thank you to our attendees for um, listening today and we look forward to talking with you soon thank you thank you very much